Hello, everyone, and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar series, where every week we talk about e-learning trends, share iSpring tips and tricks, and cover clients' cases. My name is Paulina. I am the community manager at iSpring, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And we have a very exciting topic. Today, we will be talking about film school techniques for live action video learning. And our presenter today will be Andrew Berry from Curious Line. He is the CEO and founder of this company, where he and his team create custom video um, solutions for their clients across different industries. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing today? I'm great, Paulina. It's great to be here. And hello to everyone out there who's joining us. Wonderful. So we hope that you guys will very much enjoy this session and get some really cool tips and tricks that you will be able to use in your content production. And great news, everyone. This session is being recorded, so no worries. You will receive a link to replay sometime after the webinar. But I do encourage you to stay till the very end because it's a great opportunity to address your questions directly to our expert. And to do so, please submit them in the question box, which you will find on the right side of the GoToWebinar panel. It should be somewhere at the bottom. And right now on the screen, you should see how it looks. Okay, so I think at this moment we are ready to begin. So, Andrew, let me please pass the mic over to you. All right. Thank you, Paulina. And um, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen here. Okay, excellent. So, welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to spend the, the next hour with you. Um, as Paulina said, my name is Andrew Barry, and I run a company called Curious Lion. Um, we specialize in creating custom learning experiences for clients, primarily in video, um, although we do do a lot of uh, live in-person workshop design as well. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing specifically on, um, obviously, on the video side of things. It is a speciality of ours, and specifically live action video. And what I want to do today is share with you five things that um, are it, film school techniques that are taught in film school, and, and a lot of this content is drawn from uh, literature that, that is taught in, in film school. Um, there are five things, there are five sort of components to it, and I'm going to touch on just one thing, and it's literally the tip of the iceberg in, in all five of them. Um, but it's one practical thing that I think as a learning designer, um, you can use in your scripting uh, to create better to create better videos. So it's, it's clever shortcuts and ways of conveying information um, through video that you don't have to spell out in, in your actual uh, in your actual script. Um, so I'm going to turn off my video and I'm going to start with um, a polling question here, which I'd love for you guys to complete and, and let me know. Um, I'm curious about the extent of your current experience with video. Interesting results we're getting here. Yeah, so it looks like about half of the audience is brand new to video, which is which is great. Um, there's a bit of a mix there in terms of people being involved in video production before. And we also have a few people who could teach this session as well, which is great. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I, I'm really excited about this. I, as I was think, preparing this week for it, the great thing about this, this webinar is um, I want to make it as interactive as possible. and um, hear from you as I share one thing. Uh, I'm going to, you know, give some examples of how we've applied that technique. But I'd really love to hear from you how you can have applied it, or do you think you can apply it? Um, I think that's where a lot of the learning will will happen. And, and for folks following along um, on the on the chat um, can see that. So feel free to post um, your thoughts on that as as we explore different topics. All right. So let's get started. All right, so as, as learning designers, uh, our basic goal, right, is to create a learning outcome for a particular topic and then, and then present uh, information to the learner to get them to the, the outcome, right? And so our goal there is to help them through this information processing um, by managing their cognitive load. So we present a stimulus. Um, it's, that is the input into sensory memory. 
um, most of which is is forgotten, um, but we and then selectively paying attention to to some parts of it, um, which are then which are then obviously in your short term memory. Again, we lose some to to forgetting, um, but then through well designed learning, we can we learn to encode that in long term memory, um, and then uh, you know this this the process of of retrieval um, then happens. So that's kind of our, our whole goal here, and and what I'm going to share with you are five things that we can we can do to increase attention um, and increase retention uh, in our and specifically in our script writing so that's kind of I think the the value that you'll get out of out of the session today okay so the uh, little bit about my background as, as I introduce this is that I um, you know I, I have a adult learning background I spent 10 years um, at a company called KPMG doing that and then I spent two years at a company that was specializing in video, and they didn't have a very formal uh, process for setting up their videos. Um, and I, I ended up uh, doing that for them, so creating their um, methodology, and then have since been using that um, for the last two years in my own company. Um, and the way I went about that was marrying the adult learning principles that I just touched on briefly in that previous slide with these five fundamental elements, which, which come from, um, but there's a seminal textbook in in uh, film school, um, which is called Sight, Sound, and Motion by um, a gentleman called Herbert Zettel. And he talks about, he breaks it down into five fundamental elements in film. So, and it's kind of five dimensions. So there's light and color, then there's 2D space, then there's 3D space, depth, um, and then there's sort of 4D space, which is time and motion. Um, and then there's the fifth dimension, which is sound. And all of these present different ways for us to be able to convey information. Um, so that's what I think is really exciting about that. And I'm going to, again, just touch on one thing in each of these five um, as we go through it. OK, so first of all, and, and the way I'm going to do this is show you guys a quick little video. Now, these are all um, short little clips that I've taken from uh, YouTube artists who create these incredible video essays analyzing film. I've taken little little clips of each of them. Um, I'll also sh be sharing these at the end um, with you guys so you can go in and see them. And I've included links in each of the videos to the original video. Um, so please do go and support these guys. They do incredible work. And if you're at all interested in film and, and like the geeky side of it, you can go down an absolute rabbit hole um, with this. It's very cool stuff. So uh, let's get started with the first one. Okay, let me just move this around. Okay. Next tip, use color to push emotion. Now, this one can get a little bit abstract, but the concept is simple. Again, one way to tell story through lighting is by using colors that communicate how an audience should feel about that scene. For starters, and to hit the essentials, remember that warm tones like orange, amber, and straw tend to make us feel connected, intimate, and nostalgic. While cool tones like blue, cyan, tend to make audiences feel cool and detached. Now, for going beyond those two color tones and going a little bit more stylized, just take a moment to think about how a color feels before implementing it. For an easy example, I'm sure all of us can remember a time where a saturated red has been used to emphasize urgency, passion, or danger in a scene. Um, I just want to check, and maybe, Pauline, if you can help me, was everyone able to actually hear that? Yes, yes, I was able okay. to hear it and I... We have some yeses and some, some noes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I, I think it might be a setting on the user if we've got, if some people were able to, to hear it. Um, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll look at the volume next time as well. Um, Again, I will also include tips, uh, I'll include links to these videos in, in uh, the follow-up to this webinar, so you can go back and review these. Um, so this first one was talking about color, and specifically what, what he was uh, showing the contrast there between was um, saturation, <clears throat> which is actually the, out of all of these um, aspects of color, it's actually the one that has the most impact on the way we receive information uh, when we're viewing footage or, or film. Um, and that's talking about the richness or the strength and the purity of, um, of that color. Um, so 
And that's in that in that typical example there, you show the difference between warm colors and and cool colors, and how they they and they convey sort of feelings. Um, which again, if you think about when you're scripting for a for a video, um, to be able to convey an overall feeling about something um, in without using any you know valuable space, uh, having to to script that and write that out and have have a narrator say that. Um, it's incredibly powerful, right? So one of the ways we use this, we do a lot of uh, compliance training, and uh, and if you think about, you know, there, there's often cases we we show scenarios where there's there's a good way about, of doing something, and then there's you know a bad way of doing it, and we'll contrast those two, and we'll often show that that bad way or or another good example of this is is showing the emotion of a person, you know, for example, maybe receiving feedback. Um, and so, using cool tones on on the as a filter, um, and this is all happening in the editing process, can kind of create that feeling of you know this is an, a negative emotion or this is uh, the wrong behavior, and then contrasting that with a warm sort of sensation uh, or, or filter in that saturation gives that that feeling of okay resolution you know or this is this is the correct way of doing it so. Um, I would love to hear from you guys uh, examples that you have used, and this is really what we're talking about here: is the warm versus cold colors, um, it's, and the saturation of them. Does anybody have any good examples of, of other ways that they've used that contrast to convey information? Feel free to post them in the chat. Maybe you can give an example of how you used it. Yeah, like I said, it, it's the um, compliance training is a great example of it, and we use we use that all the time. So if you imagine a scene where some character is learning about how to, um, you know, protect credit card data of their customers, for example, and you show bad behavior of them, uh, you know, leaving the room with the credit card in their hand, for example. Um, mm -hmm. That's and you show that with by adding these filters um, over it of cool colors shows this this you know sense of this is not actually um, uh, this is wrong behavior and then when you contrast that right away especially if you use some kind of clever um, transition you can show that in, a, in the right behavior happening with warm colors um, and just visually you've you've already seen this this contrast you haven't had to even describe the fact that one is bad one is good because mm -hmm. it it creates this this sense of uh, of, of that already in, in the in the viewer and the other example that I shared is when you this is to convey emotions of a character so if you um, we would be doing some some training right now videos on giving feedback um, and mm -hmm. there's certain ways to give feedback to people um, and if you show you show again showing that scene where we'll film the same scene right delivering um, good good examples of, of giving feedback and bad examples of giving feedback and then in the edits afterwards, adding these filters in of cool colors that convey this sense of, you know, cold, um, uh, you know, very like down, down feelings um, when, when, you, when you're showing that the, the bad ways of, of exhibit, of, of delivering feedback. And then the, the warm kind of uplifting saturation when you're showing ways of, um, of good feedback. So the, those mm -hmm. are some examples that we are currently using. And uh, has anybody out there got, got any... Any examples of that? Uh, this is this is definitely the part for me that that's most interesting to to hear how others might be using this technique. Yeah, we actually have some answers. Uh, Would you like okay, they're coming through in the questions. There. Okay, I was looking at the chat. Awesome. Um, yeah, so black and white um, in certain cases is is definitely um, a, a very clever technique, and there's actually um, there's obviously a whole bunch of literature on that as well. I wish I had time to go into just color um, instead of all five of these areas. Um, let's see if I maximize this window a bit more. Um, yeah, summer beach party, so like different themes, that, that's definitely uh, beach party with red and yellow hues, exactly. Um, does the principle using colors apply to non-video as well? De I, definitely, so I think you was talking about graphics or, or you know anything like that um, it it's less so in terms of an overall filter on the screen that's where it has its most impact um, for this but 
it's definitely something to consider about. Every color has a meaning. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it, again, to this point here, yeah, Elizabeth, about uh, red being warm, does it mean urgent? It, it can, it, it absolutely can. And so, again, that's the, the intensity of that saturation is what's gonna get you that kind of feeling. Like, and if you think back to that video that I showed, um, there was one scene where there's that red, very intense red, and that definitely creates urgency, even sometimes danger. Um, you know, so I think the point here again is when you're scripting and you want to convey these feelings, um, these moods, just using a simple filter on your on your edits and post production can actually do that for you, um, and it, it saves you a lot of time having to uh, to explain that in the script. A um, couple of other examples: um, express profession. Design and presentation and character development. Yep. Nesting a story told inside a main storyline. I love that. Um, yeah, definitely. And changing the, the sort of color filters um, to, to show these two different stories. And uh, you, a lot of cool things you can do there to play around with how that you know resolves and the, the colors start to match up. Um, definitely some cool ideas, yeah. Color to make words pop out. Joe, thanks for, for thinking on the spot. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so yeah, so these are all these are excellent. Um, and this is this is a good little warm-up for, for the next uh, the next four because uh, as you'll see, I, I think what's what's interesting for me, there's no, you know, there's no like there's no right or wrong answer of ways to use this. It's just more like opening up all these great ideas that you can use it for. Um, so I think for me when when I did this research initially it was just the ideas just started flowing of, of ways that you can use it in uh, in your video production. So, oh my gosh, we've got so many here, it's awesome. Um, colors to emphasize, we've got a couple minutes and I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, brain equals cool and emotion equals warm. Yeah, that's awesome. Using alpha effects to make images and words come into focus. I like that. Yeah, so, um, Danger, yeah. So Sandra, that's a, that's a that's a great point there. We've definitely used that as well. Uh, yeah. So and and just like that that emphasis and capturing attention. So that's a good transition, um, Anna, into what I'm going to talk about next, which is the the 2D aspect. So this is kind of using the the real estate that we have of a screen, all right, and how how we use that and how the borders of our screen are actually kind of magnetic and therefore attract attention in different ways. So let's go and have a look at what that looks like. Let me share the second video with you guys. All right, so I'm gonna turn my computer audio all the way up and let's hope this plays well for you guys. So with the rule of thirds, if you divide the frame into three segments, horizontally and vertically, by placing objects of interest in the intersecting points, we create an image that is pleasing to the eye. There are many books on the rule of thirds and how it applies to nature in much more detail, but just following this one simple rule can dramatically improve your shots. In a wide shot, we can create balance in the frame with how our subject matter relates to their surroundings. And when we're in a medium, we can place that person on the lines to make a pleasing frame. When we're in the close-up, by placing the eyes on the intersecting points helps draw our attention to them. The eyes, as they say, are the windows to the soul, and they automatically draw our attention to them. By placing them on the rule of thirds, we are helping to drive the viewer's attention that way. We can even sacrifice many other things by keeping the eyes on these intersecting points. We can chop off the top of somebody's head in the frame as long as the eyes are in focus. In fact, we can get away with quite a lot as long as the eyes are in focus on the intersecting points. Better uh, audio quality. Uh, so some people are still saying they're not getting the audio coming through. Okay, but I think I think a lot of people are able to hear it, and I'm gonna so I'm gonna continue with that again. We'll share these clips afterwards. You guys can refer back to them. Um, it's you're not losing too much um, by not hearing it right now. 
Um, okay, so I think this was a really interesting one for me. Um, and what they talked about here was what you see in the bottom left-hand corner, the rule of thirds, um, which is the placement of objects of people, of eyes, you, you heard was, was very, very important, which actually allows you to break certain other rules, like cutting off the top of a head, for example, if, you, if you're clever with placing eyes. Um, this is particularly, we use this a lot when we're doing interviews um, and filming interviews that are, that are part of uh, course content. Um, you can, you know, we, a lot of, uh, a lot of the tendency is to, is to place objects right in the center of the screen and it's actually shown and, and proven. And there's, there's really kind of complicated science behind this of why you actually lining objects and, and the focuses of attention slightly off center, i.e. on those rule of third lines, um, is where is it places, it's more pleasing to the eye. Um, they, they also talk about this golden section, which is two-fifths of the way from the left. Um, and that's also specifically for a Western audience, reading from left to right. Um, but that's, that's often one of the best places to place interview subjects. So another good example that we use this for is placing on-screen text or on-screen graphics. Um, so again, especially if you're looking at the intersecting points of these, um, of these lines, right? So, um, the, the sort of middle square, the, the four corners of that square um, are great areas to place on-screen text and graphics and diagrams uh, because our eye is automatically drawn to that. Um, all right, so uh, I, what, what sort of ideas have you guys had for placement and how do you think you can maybe use this concept to better place certain things on screen? Ken, the golden spiral, that sounds really interesting. I don't know if you can maybe elaborate on that for us, Ken. Go back to that. Trying to think of other ways that we do this. So um, you saw, you know, like the the, the interviewing uh, people, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the next video as well. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting um, ways that you can show interview subjects, um, which it, you've, I think you've, a lot of you may have maybe familiar with masterclass. Um, and there's a lot of these masterclass videos that you can see online where they they do a great job. It's obviously super high production quality. Um, where you've got the interviewer looking at the screen, you've also got side shots of them, um, so they're placed in a different way. All of that is helping to keep attention, right? Because it's sort of like it breaks up the potential monotony of a video that's it's just someone looking at a screen. So th those examples of different, uh, different angle shots, even just filming someone um, and, then, and then filming, you know, taking a kind of a jump cut in for a zoomed type shot, right? So if you, if, picture it's like a waist up shot of the interviewer and then do a, a cut in to kind of key into just their shoulder and head. Um, it's the same person talking in the same sentence, uh, but at the right time, you're just jumping in like that. Again, it, it, it sort of refocuses attention. Um, one of the little tip on that is we, we always try filming in 4K, um, which allows you then to not have to actually do the zoom while you're filming, but you can do that in post-production by you know by zooming into a certain part of the frame and then just having that um, in your edits. Um, ah, awesome! Golden spiral. Okay, nature's way of drawing attention. Yeah, that that's awesome, Ken. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole after this. Um, easy for adult learning to get too busy on a frame. Try to keep it simple. Yeah, that's a great point, Sandy. Um, and you know, balancing things out. It it you don't want to clutter the screen. And, and even just those simple lines, I think you saw in all those videos that you can see, even this image um, on the slide here is, is a great example of that. Um, yeah, Marcus, the chat is on a bit of a delay. It, it, that is true, but it's great. Now I'm getting all these great points. Um, using unbalanced placement for eyes to move across into the point of interest. Yeah, so yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great point that Elizabeth makes is also knowing what these rules are and then also being, creative and in, in kind of unbalancing things um, can also help shock attention or you know really grab attention in certain ways. Um, you saw that in the video where, you know, again, there was the one guy whose head was cut off a little bit. 
you had that really tight shot on just the, the, the person's eye and you sort of everything else is kind of blurred out. Um, all of those things can can be used as just really creative ways to to get attention and to you know to to focus the eye on certain things that you want them to be seeing. Um, yep, cropping an image could follow the same rules, um, Elaine. That's a that's that's exactly it. You know, so it whenever we we're doing this now all the time we're making scripts or or, or presentations um it's it's also the, the placement that you use there um is it, this this rule can definitely be applied for that um lucia so a tilted camera angle so actually in the next um, section we'll be talking about camera point of views um so i think we'll answer your your question there um ken thanks for sharing that youtube video um, everybody can see some examples there of the golden spiral. Um, yeah, negative and empty space for text. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that works really well when you've got um, an interviewer on screen. So you've got your subject and they're off to the side. Um, that's especially this golden section. If they're sitting in that golden section, you've got that whole three fifths of the screen on the right um, of empty space to use for. Uh, diagrams to support what they're saying. Um, you've got to be careful of that because you don't want to, again, overload the cognitive load of the learner, but um, it, it's it's definitely helpful for, for putting in sh small, short things to emphasize points or to, again, focus attention. Uh, use this technique for instructional videos with a focus on in the app on the right with the instructions offset to the left. Yeah, that's awesome, Marjorie. Exactly. So really, this is about being deliberate in the way you set up your your frame. Um, and we find, especially with all the scripts that we do, is is thinking about that. We you know we're writing audio visual scripts. You you setting you writing visual notes that that's going with the uh, whether it's the interview or uh, narration that that the voiceover. Um, those visual notes are are starting are thinking like things like this, right? And then our our videographers and our and our post production our edit team will bring that to life. But really starts at the script stage um, and thinking about that and being deliberate about how you're picturing this um, your training coming to life. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, that's another great point about the the talking head. Um, so that's. It's actually the interesting thing you bring up there is it's proven to be um, it actually increases learning retention um, and learning transfer by having the the face the head of the person that's presenting a, a presentation um, and so definitely something uh, to consider there. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to the third the third question here, Elaine. I see your question there. We will definitely get back to you on that as well. Um, okay, so the next one is about 3D space. So we've talked about the, the 2D space and the sort of magnetic edges of the frame um, and how to place things on the frame. Now we're talking about depth and volume in the frame. Okay, and the next clip is from a documentary called um, The Imposter, which I think was on Netflix. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, you may want to skip this because it's got a bit of a spoiler alert in it. So I just want to warn you about that. Um, but it, it's a it's a great example um, of of different creative uses of of points of view. So let me go to the video. Okay. Let's dig in. I think Bart Layton made one of the smartest, simplest decisions I've ever seen for a doc, and it's this. Every subject in this story is shot in a normal interview style, looking off-frame at someone else. Except for our bad guy. As long as I remember, I want it to be someone else. Who looks right at us. That's it. Dead simple. This angle puts us in the same room as the bad guy, judging him. But the same angle also makes us really susceptible to how persuasive he is. In other words, we know he's the bad guy, but that doesn't protect us. If you watch closely, you'll see a bunch of other decisions in the film that stem from this. Most of the reconstructions are shot from the imposter's point of view. He even lip syncs. 
I wasn't the one who was telling them I've been sexually abused. I made them ask me that. Across past and present. Other people we see from above or from below, but we're eye level here. Plus, these subjects are framed in depth, so you can see their environments and where they come from. But the imposter's background is literally a blur. He doesn't even have a title card telling us who he is. Okay, so all of these are clear directorial choices, but why? Why set up the movie so that the bad guy controls the story and how it's framed? Because the movie wants to trick you. Not in a gotcha kind of way. Just that the director wants you to experience this guy's persuasiveness. See. He spends most of the story telling us how he lied to other people and how he tricked everyone. So we know we shouldn't trust what he says. But then two thirds of the way through the film, he plays on that. Why did the family accept him so easily? Aren't they too trusting of him? I didn't need to be Colombo to put all the pieces together. I mean, why else would they accept this guy, right? They killed him. Some of them did it, some of them knew of it, and some of them choose to ignore it. Wait, what? All right. Um, so a, a really fascinating film. I, I highly encourage you to, to see that anyway, even though I've probably spoiled it for most of you. Um, it's, uh, it, what's so interesting about that is, again, it was a deliberate intent by the director to, to change something as subtle as the camera angle and, and the way, the point of view that you're looking at the um, at, at the action, right? So when you, in, in all the interviews with the, the main subject of the film, you're looking right him right in the eye, but in all the interviews with everyone else, you're looking at a point past them, right? Very subtle shift. Um, and what's happening here is is a couple of things. So first of all, there's, there's sort of three ways of, of looking at an event, right? And the event is basically the action, right? This, the story you're trying to tell or, um, or you know, to meet the, the learning outcome. Um, you can look at an event, so the point of view is of the observer, and you're looking at the what. So it, they call that um, event clarification, and a good example of that is, is in live sport. Um, we, we can also show, this is more in, in, in film, in, in movies, um, you're looking into an event, which is kind of the why, right? It's kind of behind the scenes, and we, here we talk about event intensification. So we, we're interested more in the emotions behind a conversation. Um, Again, this is so. If you know, if you if you if you think of a movie scene where someone's um, displaying an emotion, they don't need to be saying anything, but you can tell from the the emotions on a character's face um, what what's happening. Also, the going back to the the colors, right? Using hot and cold colors can also then show looking into an event, um, and then you can also create an event. Um, we don't do a lot of this at, at Curious Line. Um, this, uh, this, I think a good example of this is in, in video games, um, uh, but that's the, the first person point of view. So here we, we look to clarify, intensify, and interpret events. Um, so it's, it's, it, this, is a, this is a much trickier one to do, um, but I've, I have seen learning videos that do do this. Um, but I think mainly you're looking at, the, at one of the first two, so looking at an event and into an event. Um, and what they, what your sort of tools are as a, as a, as a videographer, and what's useful as, as someone who's writing the scripts to know, is is some of these things. So we've got field of view, which is really just the tightness of your shot. Um, so you've got an extreme long shot, and then it's going closer and closer and closer into a, a close up extreme. Um, and again, so like if you think of how to show emotions, you you often see that in a very close up or extreme close up shot of the character. Um, point of view is is a huge one, and that's what you saw done so well in that film. Is the looking um, so it objective versus subjective, but also looking directly at someone or looking past them, um, looking up at them and looking down at them shows inferiority and and superiority angles, um, and so that plays into the angles piece. So um, there's there's a lot to to kind of explore here as well, but you know. But basically, you're thinking about content continuity. In in the video there, we saw a lot of the multiple viewpoints, um, which affected the way the story was being told, um, and then invent intensification. So, um, yeah. So the way we use this again in interview type type filming, um, this is this is huge. You know, with the the different angles and and ways of looking at something. 
Um, and point of view is, for us, is something that is right at the very beginning when we're scripting and coming up with the, the character, and the, especially for, well, most of it is narrative-based. Um, coming up with narrative-based training, we, we often think about the character that, the avatar that is going to kind of represent the learner, at least the learner to be relatable to the learner. Um, is that character, do we want to show them, you know, the point of view going back to this, um, looking at them, do we want to show it from their point of view? Um, so there's a lot of things you can experiment with with here. Um, and I want to see if uh, if you guys have any examples of this that we can share as well. Um, to, for example, like another good one while I'm waiting for, for some comments here, um, the, from the point of view, um, if you want to show, you know, characters that are um, looking up, right? So camera angles looking up at someone puts that that character more on a pedestal. Um, create it can convey feelings and 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 of you know um, authority, um, respect, those kind of things. And looking down at someone has the opposite effect. Um, so again, using that to tell information about a character where you don't have to actually introduce that character, um, just by subtly changing the camera angle you're already conveying a whole lot of information about their standing and their role in, in the overall story. Don, so yeah, the question about um, interviewing when they're looking at the camera or the, or the view, the side view or frame, who are they talking to? So I, I think I understand your question here, but it's, it's done in a way that it's continuous. So it's the same, it's the same question, but, or the same person talking or answering a question. So it's just a different way of looking at it. Okay, so it, I think the, the sense of who, who the person is talking to is still the, it's still the camera, it's just a different camera. And then you get this uh, you know, side on angle of them looking at that camera. Um, it, it just, again, breaks up attention. It shows you a different way of looking at a person and it's filling in more information about the subject. I find person looking directly into your camera can make a viewer uncomfortable. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think we saw that in that video um, when you when the, the sort of bad guy in the film is, is looking directly at you the whole time. Um, it's definitely uncomfortable. Um, and again, going back to the whole process of what we're trying to do here, creating these these learning scripts, you know, being intentional about that. Is your character going to look directly at the learner? Um, at the person watching a video, or are they going to look off screen? Um, are they going to be the the, the view, the point of view? Um, it definitely changes the whole sort of uh, setup for you. Um, Ken, so creating an event, a nurse examining an avatar in a sim. Yep, exactly. Um, live action for the military. Um, teacher authority straight on at a desk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, David, I use 2D animation, and while these various camera views are possible, I'm limited by available character and prop design perspectives. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and and there's there are pros and cons, obviously, to using animation versus live action. Um, you definitely have some limitations in terms of camera views. Um, certainly, if you're using software with pre-built templates as well. Um, but there, you know, there's still ways of using. I think with 2D animation, you're right. I think, I think the previous one we looked at, where you're looking at more the 2D space and how you can use the rule of thir thirds and the magnetism of the frame, is probably where you'll get more impact. Um, but yeah, obviously here it's more about the third dimension, which which is trickier to do. Um, Elaine says, filming someone at a level 45 degree angle with their head turned toward the camera is very different. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think Elaine, to this point, it's, you know, playing around with these different angles and actually seeing what they look like is is quite, and you can do that with your cell phone, you know, it, just kind of doing that, that, um, that, you know, using a friend or a colleague and, and filming that from these different angles and see what that looks like um, and see what that tells you about a character um, that you're trying to develop. And if you're trying to, to show that person, for example, okay, this is another great example. We actually do this um, is if you want to see, if, if, your, if your goal is to show a learning outcome through the 
learn the learning process of a character, right? So you, we follow their journey of learning. Changing the camera angle from the beginning, maybe it's kind of slightly up looking down at them as they don't know how to figure out, you know, and, and they have the same kind of problems the learner has when they're starting with the subject. And you, sh you show them start to get to familiar with it and start to pick up new skills and changing that camera angle, angle very subtly to then look up at that person creates this, this kind of resolution, you know, that they've now, um, that they've now learned that. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, let's see how we're doing for time. Okay, so let's now move on to the fourth fourth dimension, which is time and motion. Okay, and so what we've got here is um, is basically so, we, and we've covered every aspect of the screen in terms of a a scene. Now we're talking about moving from scene to scene. So we we're talking about the time elapsing in a in a video and the motion of characters within the video. And specifically in this one, I want to focus on transitions and how powerful those can be to create momentum in our learning videos. Because one of the biggest challenges we all know is we don't want to have videos that are too much longer than you know three to five minutes. Um, uh, and and to to keep information down to that sort of small uh, bite-sized nuggets of of content is is challenging. And transitions and momentum can help us with that. So let's have a look what that looks like. Our goals are the same, to make a persuasive and engaging argument. And just like writers pay close attention to the flow of their words, carefully crafting the transitions from one idea to the next, I see the rhythm and momentum of my videos as crucial to their effectiveness. And here's where I can learn a lot from Edgar Wright. Can I get back to you on that? Edgar Wright is a master of rhythm. What you just saw is one of many extraordinary scene transitions from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. It lasts about four and a half seconds, but it's worth taking a second, slower look. This transition is all about movement to the right. It kicks off with Anna Kendrick looking to camera right, which is the direction of the movement, but she's also looking at her brother through the split screen. Her split screen is keyframed off to the left, and so is Scott Pilgrim's. But Wright has cleverly positioned him left in the frame so he can bring in the unseen right-hand part of the shot to extend the dolly wipe. In the right of that frame is the armchair, which wipes across to reveal the next outdoor setting, and the onomatopoeia letters of the school bell aid this transition into a shot that continues the motion by actually dollying to the right. If you were to diagram out this transition, it would look a little like this, and it gives you a better sense of just how much care is put into a handful of frames. Um, so Edgar Wright, I don't know, for, for those of you who, who are not familiar, he did Scott Pilgrim, um, Hot Fuzz, a lot of those kind of movies. He is an absolute master at transitions. And you can see uh, how much thought, how much effort, how much you know, detail went into just that one transition. Um, but what he was able to do there in, I think it was, it wasn't even a few seconds, was, was show you know, that scene transition and, and put us right in this schoolyard where you know, the, the closing bell is gone and people are leaving uh, school. Um, it, he does, he do, the, all of his films are just littered with these kind of transitions. Um, there was a lot going on there. Um, there was, um, so he mentioned the, you know, so the framing we, we saw as well, which we talked about earlier, um, was quite interesting of just positioning characters in different places, especially so that he could then transition with the wipe. So that was another thing he mentioned. We'll talk about a wipe in a second. Um, and then at the end, how the camera dollied. Um, and this is kind of some of the principles here of, of time and motion in film. So um, you've got essentially three different types of, of motion. Um, you've got primary motion, which is the event itself, um, and that's occurring in front of the camera. So that's, you know, the people walking out of the schoolyard, there's motion coming towards you as the viewer. Um, then you've got the secondary motion, which is the camera, um, which can either fan, tilt, zoom, or, or dolly. Um, and what the difference between that basically is that in zoom, the subject is moving closer to the camera, right, through through the zoom, zooming in and zooming out, whereas in dollying, the camera is actually moving closer to the subject. And that has a subtle difference in, in effect on, on the viewer. Um, and then finally, the tertiary 
um, which which we saw done so well and probably was one of the best um, out there, is that the struct changes, so the transition from from scene to scene. Um, what this basically allows you to do is control the pace and the rhythm of your videos. So when we're scripting um, our, our learning videos, we pay very careful attention to those transitions and try to come up with creative ways. I wish we could be as, as good as, as Edgar Wright, um, but creative ways of transitioning from scene to scene so that we can tell a complete story, moving a, a learner through that learner journey to, to get to that learning outcome um, in the most efficient and, and effective way. Um, so I will. Um, I want to hear some of your thoughts on that, Sandy. The dolly is. I hopefully I answered your your question there. Um, the yeah, one of the ways we do this is um, using the wipe transition. So I said I'd come back to that. Um, you saw him do that there with the the word the onomatopoeia um, of the bell is was the, the sort of wipe there. We'll often use um, for when we're doing client projects. We'll use the you know a, a, a branded kind of wipe transition which comes across the screen and try and follow that right away with movement so primary movement um, motion happening in front of the camera that's in the same direction of that wipe okay so um, an example of that is um, trying to think so we, we, we do a lot of um, software training as well creating software training to to help um, our clients teach their customers how to use their software and if we're transitioning uh, that can get kind of technical right because it's, it's looking at the same thing and you, you you've seen some clicks and that kind of stuff um, using a transition and a wipe that that goes across screen and then have the next scene kind of be even if it's just the cursor that's moving following that wipe to then click somewhere to the left of screen if the um, if the wipe was happening from right to left is is an effective way of not you know it, it keeps the momentum going so you can actually edit the video a lot more uh, I'd say liberally um, you can be quite quite severe in your your cuts but if you're using smooth transitions it really kind of helps um, keep the pace going and it doesn't affect uh, any of the, the learner journey um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this uh, David says I thought the scene transitions after the first were discordant and poorly structured. Um, interesting, interesting observation there, David. I th so I think you're you're referring to the video that we saw. Um, it's I, so I think you know looking at it in slow motion and breaking it down like that can can definitely have that effect. I don't know if that's what you saw as well, um, but I would I would encourage looking at it again in real time and just kind of especially other examples of what of what uh, Edgar Wright does. In fact, I think if, um, if when you download these slides and you you'll get a link to this video, I've included the link to the original of that video, um, and it's about 20 minutes worth of really great examples um, of scene transitions. So you you might get some good inspiration from that. Um, yeah, complex camera gear is definitely required. Yeah, dollying you know does require. A track and and some kind of movement. Um, although these days, you know, you can you can do some pretty some pretty nifty work um, with like a Ronin or you know so various ways that you can you can move a camera in and out of, of um, a scene. Um, but yeah, it, it is one of the more complex things. Um, but you could play around with zoom. You know that that's a that's another way of of creating this kind of movement. Um, and you know, even like starting a scene with a very tight, keyed-in shot of a of a subject and zooming out helps quickly create that context of of where you know the the image that we've just seen is coming from. Um, Sandy, a, a question on the type of tripod. I think we've had a few questions about gear, and I think what I can do um, is is follow up um, with Polina and potentially provide some some tips and resources there. The thing, the tricky thing, is it, it depends. You know, it depends on the size of the budget, um, what you're looking to achieve. Um, so there's not really a, a set answer I can give there. Um, yeah, Don. So um, can you pay the, discuss the difference in using a DSLR? That's uh, I'm not going to be able to cover that in in this session, but um, I'd love to chat to you more about that. So. Um, at the end, we'll be sharing my contact details. So you, if you have specific questions like that, I'm happy to give you um, my thoughts on that and point you guys in the right direction. So, so definitely reach out to me uh, with some of these questions. All right, I want to get to the last one quickly and then be able to leave some time for questions at the end. So let me play the last video on the fifth dimension, which is sound.
Walter Murch had this great saying. He said, you know, images come in through the front door, but sound comes in through the back door. So you can be a lot sneakier with manipulation. You can dig into that reptilian part of the human senses, um, and in a way, with sound, become kind of a puppet master of emotions. When writing, one of the most important goals is to make the audience empathize with your characters. And the same is true of the sound design process. Within every storytelling you know, uh, process, there's, there's gonna be moments where we wanna experience what the characters are experiencing in a, in a visceral way. And I think sound is really one of the key tools that we have as filmmakers to help create that experience. An example of this is found in the original screenplay for A Quiet Place. There is a moment that is written in such a way that the reader perceives the action from a single character's perspective because of the sound. Exterior woods, path, afternoon. April gets very still. She turns up the volume on her hearing aid. Just faintly, through the high-frequency static, we hear the baby crying in the distance. April stifles her breathing. The sound of something else continues breathing behind her. Out of focus, just 10 feet away, we see it move slowly towards the sounds. Writing the moment this way makes the audience experience the story events through the point of view of the character. And this technique was utilized several times in the final film. film um, an example of clever use of sound and in, in, in a film especially that has to use this is Bird Box. Um, so I don't know if anybody um, on here, if everybody's seen it, um, I think it's on Netflix as well. Definitely have a look at that for really good examples of, so, you know, there's often, there's a lot of scenes where the characters are blindfolded and you see it from their point of view and so you're only relying on sound. Um, so I, I think um, the thing the thing that we apply in in creating our learning uh, videos here is that essentially that sounds can convey information um, and all sorts of things right location environments um, energy rhythm everything that you you see on here there are a lot of, of very technical elements of sound um, as well as basic sound structures um, which, which you can see on on screen I'm not going to go into these in, in too much detail now. Um, but essentially what we, what we do is, is use sound and write in, in our scripts, like you saw on, on screen in that video, um, how are we gonna use sound to convey information? Um, one good example of this is if we wanna film an office scene um, and we wanted to create some kind of um, sense of, of, you know, of volume of, of a lot of people in the office, even if we say filming with only three characters or three actors, um, we we will use you know background sounds of offices so you know fax machines and computers and you know just general kind of office sound in the background creates that sense that we're in an environment that is much bigger than potentially the environment that you just see in front of you. Um, so that's an, a good example of that. But um, we saw in the previous video with the the sound of the bell you know being used as a way to transition between scenes as well. It's another clever way um, of using sound. And um, very often you don't have to actually say something. Again, what we I always try and tell my scriptwriters is we want to try and limit the amount of words we're saying. Most of our stuff um, we do is, is got voiceover. So there's there's you know, or it's dialogue, but it's mostly voiceover. We want to try and limit the amount of voiceover of, of the way we say things to directly and rather think of how can we show that more creatively. Um, and sound becomes really one of those. Um, kind of tools in our tool belt. Um, so has anybody got any good ideas of how they, uh, how they use sound? Um, so I'm looking at Don here, um, using Hollywood Star Clips to illustrate these principles is grand. But yeah, so okay, that's being realistic here, Don, I think it's, it's a very important point to make is that um, this is, as you say, it's illustrating principles here. Um, there's obviously always going to be constraints in terms of what you can do, um, and so it's not uh, it's not to get kind of disheartened to say like I can't achieve any of that. There's actually a lot you can do, and there's a lot that we're applying in our in our videos that are coming from principles that you can see in in uh, uh, in these videos. And 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's it would be great if we had these kind of budgets to be able to do some of the really cool things in here. But you know, even just using like the examples I've shared of uh, putting color filters on your on your videos in post production, or using transitions deliberately, or using sound in a way to convey information, all of those things can add um, a lot of value to to your videos. Um, I have no idea where to find these sounds. So Elizabeth, there are tons of great resources online. Again, if you if you want to message me um, separately, I can share that with you. Um, there's actually there's there's great stock uh, sounds which you can purchase. Um, there's also a lot of good free resources out there for um, under Creative Commons licenses. Um, Alice, I wish I had more time to talk about voiceover tips. We've got tons um, of experience with that. That is definitely one of the uh, one of the most common things that we're focusing on. Um, so again, if you want to message me afterwards, I'm happy to, to pick that up with you. Um, Sandy says, it could be interesting to try and illustrate what a person with dementia is experiencing or someone being trained. I, I love that. Um, you, you are clearly responsible for a lot of um, training in the healthcare industry. And I think that's a, a great way of, of describing that is, um, again, it's, it's that point of view. You know? So if you're showing, um, you need to show if you're your learner is the person that's um, caring for someone with dementia and you need to show to them you know what it's like to have it or um, and you you have that you create that point of view um, you can definitely you can definitely use sound to do that yeah Don um, offers telephone traffic sets an environment yeah it's just it creates a, and again that's something you can do on a fairly low budget um, so that's a, that's a great point um, sound Bible David that's a great suggestion we use a lot of that as well um, I do think some of the principles can, yeah, Jeff, that's a great point. Uh, still images, again, it's 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 the principle that's interesting here. It's not the execution necessarily um, of how they do it in Hollywood. Um, it's it's nice to just watch it done beautifully. Um, I'm sure you will we'll all agree. Um, Jeff, so this will be presented as a series. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're alluding to the fact that we can go into a, a lot more detail on each of these um, and that, it really is a lot of depth that, that can be explored here. Um, and we, we're definitely scraping the surface, um, unfortunately. Um, is there a resource for PowerPoint transitions that are effective? Another great question, Elizabeth. Um, th th there isn't, again, a hard and fast rule in this. Um, there are examples of things that work well, and some things will work better in different subjects. Um, so again, if you want to um, chat to me afterwards, I'd be happy to share some examples of, of that with, for you. Okay, um, as we're starting to wrap up here, we don't have much time for Q&A, but I think we have, um, we have actually got the, um, we've done a lot of Q&A through this, and, and if you guys have any more questions for me, or anything specific that, that you think um, we can help with, I'm always up for a chat. I really do enjoy this stuff. Um, I enjoy learning from it, which is why I'm so um, grateful that you were able to share a lot of good ideas here. Um, we're always learning new stuff all the time. Um, so this is how you can get hold of me. Um, we've also got some um, some free resources here that you can download um, if the, if you find this stuff interesting. Specifically, this one on the left, which is more as a more curated list, um, full videos of these kind of things and all different areas, from editing to screenwriting to uh, to character development to sound, um, to give you some really some good ideas and inspiration for for some of the training that you're doing. Um, I think Polina will be sharing this this PDF in a in an email with you guys, so you can also you'll get access to these links. You can click them there and and download um, these resources. So I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for for your great suggestions here and, and participation. Um, I really enjoyed this, and and I hope you did too. Thank you so much, Andrew. This has been a wonderful presentation, and I am super happy that you found some time to share your tips and tricks with our audience. We very much appreciate it, and I hope that you guys enjoyed the session as much as I did, and I'm sure that you will be able to apply some of the um, great Mm, tips shared during today's session in your content creation. That's just some creativity, I guess, that needs to be taken into action. And yes, um, yeah, we actually are out of time here, but I will be sharing uh, Andrew's presentation and also um, the way you guys can get a hold of him, uh, as well as all the helpful links to resources. 
and other great materials. So I would like to thank you guys for tuning in today and making this session very much interactive. And we do appreciate it. And Andrew, thanks to you for speaking for us today. Thank you. I, I had a great time. And good luck to everyone. And, and I hope you find some inspiration on your next project. <laughs> wonderful. OK, guys, so I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And we'll see you at our next webinar. And by the way, just to make sure that everybody knows, let me just very quickly share the link with you where you will be find where you will be able to find all our previous sessions as well as the schedule for the future upcoming webinars. OK, so again, have a great day. See you at the next. Bye, Andrew. Bye-bye. Thank you.